Hello, everyone. I hope everybody can hear me. Hi, welcome. Um, today we're going to hear from Nader Zaveri, and he's going to talk to us about the art of productive remediation. Um, a little bit background about him. Nader Zaveri has over 12 years of experience in IT security, infrastructure, and risk management, and has led transformational projects over infrastructure and processes with technical and organizational change components in response to rapidly evolving business needs and regulatory requirements. So welcome. I think I'm going to use this one. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. As she stated, uh, sounds a lot more formal. It's not. I've just been. I'm just a lot older than I look. And this is pre-mediation, the art of proactive remediation. If you're here to how to bake a cake, you're in the wrong place. It's probably in the other hall. Um, a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to go through a case study. So I I do incident response for Mandiant and. We are in majority of the major breaches. So this case study is actually from a real life attack that's happened at a client. And we're gonna walk through exactly what happened and how the attacker was able to gain a foothold in the environment. As well as we'll go through three main kind of the exploitation model, we call it access, credentials, and connectivity. After that, we'll have some Q and A. If you have any questions, we're gonna kind of talk about the different ways of how you can fix or proactively uh, fix it for your environments. Once again, Nader Zavera, my principal consultant with Mandiant. I'm in the incident response and remediation uh, team, the transformational team. I've done dozens, if not hundreds, of incident responses where a client gets hacked. They call me and my team to investigate how they got hacked, who accessed the data, how much data was accessed, and then also with my team, we provide remediation steps to quickly contain and eradicate the attacker and uh, perform also strategic level steps so, so they won't get hacked in the future. So a lot of this is coming from real life scenarios that we've seen out in the field. Turning this into, instead of being reactionary, we wanna be proactive. And this is kind of where we're gonna talk about. One thing we must know is breaches are inevitable. We must always assume breach at the accountant, at the kind of what we like to call tier two level the accountants, the marketing guy, even the IT guy, they're gonna click on an email, uh, a phishing email. They're gonna go to a website with a malware. That's something, it, that's inevitable. One thing that we can prevent is the impact of breaches. How much would a, if somebody were to gain credentials at a person who's an accountant level, how far can they traverse around your environment to the point, can they get to that God level credentials as domain admin or Will they just stay in that level tiering system? And that's something that we're gonna kind of talk about how you can prevent these types of scenarios. This specific case study is, uh, we had a client call us. This is actually a very sophisticated client. So this is a large organization with a very mature security environment. They had a phishing, like I said, phishing email, somebody uh, clicked an email. They had local admin on their box. So once again, uh, most, Users and most uh, people have local admins. Unfortunately, this was kind of the practice. Uh, probably in your organizations, you have local admin or your accountant. That's because it's ease of use. You don't have to worry about from the help desk calling to install an application. But with newer programs like you know SCCM and other distrib uh, software distribution types of programs, you don't have to do that. And they ha they are able to compromise the credential. They were able to sweep any sort of cache credentials and um, put it in a backdoor. So they got system level access, got a backdoor within the VDI for persistence. And with that, with the way AD is set up, and if you were in the talk earlier about uh, group policy, Active Directory is set up, you can read, once you have a normal user can read all types of attributes within AD. So they did internal reconnaissance, you know, using things like AD Explorer, things that you can find online, or just doing some PowerShell, uh, PowerShell, a kind of get AD object, things like that, to kind of understand the environment. Once they're able to kind of laterally move, because they have system level access, a lot of times, and you may also know this, your system account on workstations, are it's probably the same throughout, unless you've implemented things like LAPS, CyberR, things like that. Your system account, not the local admin, because that could be a user, but your system account usually gonna be same throughout the workstations. 
So that allowed for the attacker to go from one area to the, to another, and until they keep scraping uh, privilege uh, credentials until they find that help desk admin, then they privilege up to the help desk tier. Then they see the system admin or server admin, then they and then they find that domain admin is what what they're really looking for. That's that god level privileges within the domain. What we did when we were called in, we did some quick eradication. We blocked network-based indicators. Network-based indicators are the IPs, the bad domains that are used. Like for example, this is a phishing, so we found out which IP they were coming from. As I said, this is a fairly organ, uh, fairly mature in, uh, environment. So we were able, they were able to find out within 72, 72 hours. As you know, you've probably heard of certain attacks being in there for years or even months, mo months or even years. And this was within 72 hours, they were able to catch this right away. So we, right away, we blocked network-based indicators. I bad IPs, sinkhole domains within DNS, and removed the back doors because we were able to find out which uh, systems it was accessed. We removed the web shows that they were implanted, and we had to rebuild the VDIs. What we did, unfortunately, they did not have was multi-factor authentication, or two-factor, on their externally facing virtual desktop infrastructures or Office 365, which most of you guys, if you are on Office 365 and you're not two-factoring, that is something you may need to start kind of having those conversations around, because especially for those who are privileged or ha have a higher tier users, um, who have higher, uh, who are privy to high, uh, different types of things. Multi-factor authentication is kind of the first step that we would always uh, ask, and they were able to implement it, and but not totally throughout the environment. And they did a targeted password reset, which is any user that was seen as being accessed or compromised, they automatically reset their passwords. They didn't do a full enterprise password reset. We're going to get into that, and they were able to implement LAPS, which is Microsoft's ability for local accounts and having them randomized and changed, but not a full deployment. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. So, coast is clear. We're, they're happy. We're leaving the, uh, finishing our IR and remediation. Two months later, they came knocking again. Same attackers, but they used a very, <laughs> this is a funny because it was a very sophisticated method they used. One thing, they were able to, remember everyone went to multi-factor authentication for Office 365. One thing where they were able to find is they were able to find a CAS server, which is a client access server with a public IP. In that public IP, uh, if they were accessed from the public IP range, MFA was not enabled for that. So they were able to just gain somebody's credentials, which I said, remember, credentials is the lowest form of security. So you always have to assume the, somebody's gonna get phished. They had another phishing campaign, found whoever, uh, accountant, marketing, even IT. Let's be honest, I've seen IT guys and IT security guys click phishing emails. It, I don't wanna just hearken onto accountants and marketing guys. And once they're able to gain that credentials, they're able to log into their email via the CA, uh, public CAS server IP. And what they did was they started, uh, what they, they created a rule in, uh, in their Outlook, in that person's Outlook folder, a forwarding rule. So anytime one-time password was accessed, they were using email for one-time password, they pushed it out to a separate folder so the person won't get notified. And then they, when they traversed the environment, they were using, anytime they logged in, so they're even doing two-factor. So they're at, after a while, they were logging in two-factor and just using the one-time password that was pushed off to a folder, which if you know, you, if you have an inbox inundated with emails, you're not looking at a random folder that you start seeing come up here and there. So that's a very, I mean, uh, it's a very easy way to kind of uh, bypass uh, someone. They log into the VP, uh, VDI again with the two-factor and just credential dumped the entire time. So they were trying to log into the VDI, had the MFA and uh, just credential dumping and then lateral movement again. So they're back in because they didn't implement kind of the long-term solutions. It was more of a containment and eradication steps. Then called us again, we investigated and they were able to actually catch this specific event with the new attacker within three hours. So if you think, I mean, like I said, this is a very sophisticated organization. They were still able to get breached and compromised within three hours. And we were able to do a full enterprise password reset. What this means is 
uh, within Active Directory. Uh, this is not an Active Directory class, but a lot of these uh, kind of remediation steps start at AD because AD seems to be that one thing that people like to exploit a lot. And within Active Directory, there's a, uh, an account that is created when you create a domain. It's called a KRB TGT account. It's a Kerberos ticket granting ticket account. If I don't want to get into the uh, complexity of Kerberos authentication, but this is considered the golden ticket. And this account stays in the domain. And once somebody is able to get some sort of privilege access, and they're able to get the gold, and then they're able to get the golden ticket. It doesn't matter if you change your password. 10 times. If they have the golden ticket, they will always come back in using the golden ticket. Because it's the one that grants the ticket. It's the way it, the authentication works. Um, they enhance their current visibility and detection. Remember, they were able to cache this in three hours, meaning their current visibility and detection was already pretty good. In three hours, I mean, if you guys can catch something in three hours, that means you have a pretty decent. But there was a lot of specific um, event IDs that we had recommended for them to implement for catching and that they did not get a chance to employ. Network architecture, there's a lot of, okay, once they realized we thought we had all our external VDIs covered, but they were still able to come in from a public IP of a CAS server, which when you're thinking about it, that's not something from a normal system admin, exchange admin, even network admin, you're not even thinking about that. But these are ways, like I said, the attackers are always trying to find one method to get in. Once they have that one method, if the way you're architected, it's gonna be a simple kind of privilege escalation until they get to their specific account. Then they did privilege account. Uh, so what we did with the full remediation was also uh, privilege account management and usage. So what this is, is a tiered architecture. This is something that Microsoft has been pushing for some time now which is break up your accounts in tiers. Tier zero will be your domain controller, domain admin accounts. Tier one is like your system admin, network admin, exchange admin. Tier two is your normal account. So normally, if you have domain admin now, you should have actually three accounts. One is your tier two account, which is what you log in, check your email. Please do not have a mail enabled uh, administrative account. That is the easiest way. They won't even have to privilege escalation. They just get your credentials if you're checking your email and they already have keys to the kingdom. The second account will be your privilege account that you do system admin type duties. If you're working on a server, patching servers, uh, you know, installing specific uh, things within SCCM, that is your tier two account, or tier one account. The tier zero account, which is just domain admin account, it is preferred never to always have this password, especially with things like just-in-time administration, with uh, domain admin. There should never be a persistent domain admin with hands-on keyboard. Now, there are break glass accounts that's kind of get, getting a little bit too deep in there, but there's break glass accounts you want to always have within the environment. But a person, a day-to-day -day person, should never have a same username and password on that uh, domain uh, admin group at all times. MFA implementation review and redesign. So we, as we stated, we had MFA implemented on all, we thought we did on all external uh, facing servers, CAT, uh, but turns out that CAS server was not MFA, which uh, then allowed them to gain access. And then we did a full lapse implementation. We implemented for partial workstations. Now we did full workstations and all servers. And one thing, uh, how many of you guys heard of the word pre-mediation before? Good, because we just made that word up. This is something that we just created from scratch. It is proactively, proactively implementing common remediation measures and recommendations within an environment. As I stated, we've, I've probably been through dozens and hundreds, and I have clients who've been, uh, have colleagues who've been through hundreds of IRs. And within these IRs, we're seeing the same common denominator of how attackers are going about attacking a, uh, an organization or a government. We do have government clients as well. And with this, we created some proactive steps that you can implement today to kind of reduce the attack surface, reduce the impact of breaches. A, a very simplified exploitation model is access plus some credentials plus connectivity equals profit. Whether that is profit from a ransomware side or just profit of getting your IP data, just getting uh, your keys to your kingdom to then uh, maybe uh, 
if uh, depending on the method of attack, if they just want to have some sort of uh, your data or your um, ability to not function or just kind of be destructive. How is access obtained? Uh, two major common attack vectors are externally facing systems that you have exposed to the internet without, uh, between DMZ and internal resource, there's lack, there's very limited uh, segmentation between DMZ and your internal resources. Uh, these are uh, kind of public facing, and if they're public facing, they're just gonna be attacked all the time. If they don't have multi-factor and other things implemented, then this is gonna be an issue, as well as phishing emails. As I mentioned, phishing emails is very common. It's very easy to do from the attacker side. They'll be able to implement this right away. Some of the methods within externally facing systems are kind of vulnerability. So as you are probably aware, every week you're seeing a new vulnerability come out for this X system on Red Hat and Windows and making sure these are updated, right? As soon as it comes out, if it's a critical patch, Windows or any other, making sure these are implemented, especially if they're externally facing, there's really no business need that, that more than trumping a, a possible breach. Um, access using legitimate credentials, right? So brute forcing and credential spraying accounts, username and password is the lowest form from an attacker side. They can gain that anytime. And using uh, externally facing system, they do brute forcing, using rainbow tables and just previous phishing campaigns. Most people, I was kind of talking with some people earlier, if they're using their password to log into their bank or some random forum on some obscure website, that username might be different because it's their username that they, uh, for, the, uh, for the corporation, but their password's gonna be the same. You know, and people using the same password throughout all their different environments, corporate, personal, these are, you know, it's just a matter of somebody just using a, a table that's already been posted on the dark web to be able to get some credentials. Some examples of some vulnerability exploitation, Eternal Blue that just came out. It, it, um, it goes and the vulnerability is SMB v1, which is within how certain uh, things connect and operate. And vulnerability in third party applications, web logic servers, WordPress servers, these things are Red Hat, Linux servers. These are all types of examples that you'll see. And you know, having a vulnerability management program, making sure these are run weekly to be able to um, kind of deter some of this exploitations from getting out. And as soon as you do find something that is a major exploitation, making sure you can remediate as soon as possible. Some of the externally facing uh, from a remote desktop is enabling on the internet, single factor, VPN, Citrix environment. We've been on a lot of clients where they're able to gain access to Citrix. They have single factor for Citrix. And from the Citrix terminal, they can get out of the Citrix and then go into your internal environment because of there's some lack of specific security configurations. With phishing emails, as everyone's aware of, we get them all the time. Embedded link, have you download a uh, Word document in Excel or just click a link and you, they'll have you go to a specific website. And some of these look very realistic and the ability to make very realistic looking uh, websites for phishing campaigns is actually very easy. And then having malicious att attachment on with macros enabled, and we're gonna talk about some of these things on how, as an organization, we know there are certain things that are business needed, right? You need to enable macros for the finance guys to run certain things, but there's still ways to still defend your environment without having to totally stop business production. Some of the, uh, uh, methods of externally facing systems from a pre-mediation. So now we're talking about how we can try to figure out. So you want to scan, identify, mitigate externally facing systems we're using whatever vulnerability management software, Nessus, you know, whatever you need to scan it. And uh, vulnerability MFA, th with that you put in, uh, you look at the vulnerabilities, you make sure there's no bypassing from MFA, from multi-factor authentication, and remove all single factor authentication segment these systems from DMZs using certain communications. So SMB, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a method for a lot of uh, specific 
uh, exploits like Eternal Blue and PS Exec. These things use SMB to, to traverse an environment as a connection. Uh, RDP, what level of RDP? If you're using, uh, we're gonna get to the next part, which is RDP with network level authentication. So if you've ever RDP'd into a server, you go into that server and then it gets prompted. Once you connect, you get prompted the username and password, right? What network level authentication for RDP is, and this has been out since Vista, is it uh, requires you to authenticate before a connection is made. So what you'll have to do, you have to put in your username and password, and unless that is correct, then you'll be able to connect to the uh, specific server. This would have protected Eternal Blue, because Eternal Blue would have was one of the exploits that this used, as well as using uh, you know denial of service attacks because it's you know once you've already established a connection that's when they start doing denial of service. This one there's no connection until the uh, credentials are authenticated. Another one is restricting inbound access and you know disabling legacy and vulnerable protocols. SMB v1. As soon as that came out, Eternal Blue, Microsoft came out with a uh, a specific um, patch for it as well as Blue Keep. Uh, these are all different patch. Uh, I kind of know some of the, unfortunately, I know some of the patch numbers by heart, speaking about this so much, but these are specific patches that Microsoft have came, uh, came out with. You want to definitely take these patches, and if you have SCCM or any sort of kind of pushing out a Windows update, if you're still using WSS, double check if your environment has all these implemented. You might be uh, shocked that maybe a certain group of servers are not or a certain group of applications and then that's really you have to kind of start talking with the application owners or server owners on why that's the case should not be especially with these things that are very common and out there in the in the environment a, a pre-mediation for phishing you know disabling macros and other M uh, microsoft hardening measures removing local administrative permission from standard users as i mentioned earlier most people have local admin Really, that should not be the case with these specific distributed software programs. Use separate account for daily usage. You should not be logging in with your administrator account with the ability to lo uh, to get into your email. You should not. That's 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 kind of a big no-no. Patch systems as much as possible, and as critical patches should always be patched first. And you kind of go on and disable legacy protocols. Some of the. Uh, Abilities within Microsoft Office and Office 365 to be disabling, you know, macros and OLE type stuff where it has a uh, the ability to um, auto update links. You want to be able to for somebody to click yes, auto update, as opposed to automatically auto updating, so, because an attack will send a phishing email with a embedded link inside of a Word document. And in that Word document, it will then go out to a specific, uh, a malicious site. With that, it will give the option for the client, uh, for the end user to say, do you want to update? And usually that will always give, if you've ever seen that happen, it, you're always like, okay, why is there an externally, why is my Word document that I was sent trying to go out to the internet to get uh, an updated link? That's something that will kind of throw people off. Auto da downloading of content, same thing, which is you know dynamic data exchange, the DDE auto downloading. You want to make sure you enable it, but also enable it for asking, right? You want to make sure they want to ask to be enabled. Some security baselines for Office 365. Um, Microsoft came out with the ADMX, which is ADGPOs, uh, group policy organization, specifically for Office that are like templatized for security. And this is something that they've been using a lot. Attack service reduction, you know, it. what it does, if you have Office 365, you wanna see what tenant number are you, you know, if you're E1, E3, E5, or even at a different level. With E5s, this is automatically uh, enabled, as well as some of the um, specific functions around um, some of the, uh, from the logging and the metrics and, and some of the behavioral stuff. If you have E3, you can enable this as an add-on, but uh, you can only kind of do it from a Windows event viewer standpoint, so you still be able to see what's happening. What it does is it stops malicious code from happening. It, it, uh, it, 
it's very good on behavior. So it gets a good day-to-day -day tasking of how what is considered a normal behavior of a user. This is more behavioral analytics, heuristics. And after that, it'll kind of set a baseline. So anything that is off, it'll start alerting. If you have not set up, hey, if somebody who is a, a local person in California logging in, but now he, somebody's logging in from Nigeria at 2 a.m., if you haven't set up this types of alert, this will automatically trigger it because it's considered a non-normal activity. Removing local administrative permissions, we talked about uh, laughs, but also something called SC debug privilege. In the recent, what is it recent? Recent, <clears throat> uh, Windows came out with a um, KB um, 287-1997. Within this, they had a, a specific thing. So as a user, there's a certain attribute called SE debug privilege. You, as a user, should only be able to do it for yourself. That is normal, Microsoft. But with the, uh, with the passage of time, it actually, Microsoft, you can do it for any users on that same system. What that means is, if you are able, you can then go inside, if you have SE debug privilege allowed for any user, you could then say net add administrators, whoever you want, Bob, Sally, Joe, and you can add anybody to the administrators group. And this is something that Microsoft came out with with, with that specific KB, and you're able to stop that now uh, with making sure it's set to zero. And uh, patch and third party and disable legacy protocols. SMBV1, making sure that's disabled. Uh, there are scripts out there to verify what version of SMB is being used. I will tell you right now, majority of organizations still use SMBV1. Majority of organizations. And PowerShell 2.0, uh, it, you know, it is a lot of specific issues with PowerShell 2.0. There's now people on PowerShell 5 and 4 and things like that, which is also from administrative side, there's a lot of great things that you could do from PowerShell 4 and 5, version 4 and 5 from a querying and a administrative that, you know, if your administrators want, it, they're not going to really lose sleep if they do get to uh, PowerShell 5. The next thing, as remember, access plus credentials. How are credentials obtained? Is credentials are stored either in memory or in disk, and that's the way the cookie crumbles, the way my, uh, Windows is set up. The reason is, there's a reason why you don't have to specifically put in your username and password for each task. It is because it is stored in memory, and it is the way that Microsoft intended, and that's the way the operating system is intended. Um, but the, uh, the way is you could extract passwords from disk using pass a hash and other methods, as well as hash from memory using things like Mimikatz. If you've ever done any sort of pen testing or was part of the CTF, Mimikatz, proc dump, you name the tools now, They're, they can crack your password. They're, that's the one they take it from memory and they place it in clear text for you. Another way is, as I, if you recall, I said the Kerberos ticket, granting ticket, the golden ticket. One thing is requesting tickets from a service account, you know, is specifically, you have, does not require administrative access. As well as clear text passwords and, and group policy preferences as well as uh, one thing uh, we talked about in the workshop is Microsoft, people used to put in their passwords for the local accounts within a group policy, but then Microsoft then goes out and publishes their uh, specific uh, the private key. So it was technically hashed, it was, it was actually encrypted, but then they publish a private key, which then it comes out to a clear text. So this is a lot of clients we see still enable it. It was for ease of administration before LAPS was kind of created to do this and you know legacy settings with clear text password stored in memory uh, applications with clear text these are all ways attackers can obtain credentials things that store credentials in memory interactive logon so that is you actually physically logging into a server or a workstation rdp when you're remote desktoping into a server that is saving it into memory ps exec with credentials using ps exec that is going to save into memory. Batch logons uh, running as you know a scheduled task. PowerShell CRET SSP. This is a uh, way that PowerShell used to uh, log in. There's a specific uh, update, and you can get control that from uh, GPO settings.
What are some ways to harden your credentials? Is minimize privilege credential exposure. Hardened systems and service accounts can be on local standard endpoints. Remove the capability for local admins to be used for remote logon. You don't want your local admins to be logging on to systems oh, that are not pertinent to their daily job. You can reduce that with specific uh, GPOs after you've uh, did some updates. Randomize password, this is around laps. And harden endpoints so that clear text passwords are not stored in memory. Some of the ways to go about it is the tiered architecture model. The tiered architecture model really uh, is, is one of the great things that kind of Microsoft is really pushing out. And I'll actually tell this to all my clients when they've been breached, whether they've even, after there was a method of a privilege account uh, escalation or not, because what it does is it, it tiers your, uh, your accounts from a domain admin to server exchange to a normal account, but also one of the big things is it denies the ability for a domain admin, who's usually considered the god around the domain, to be able to log into a tier one or tier two level. And you can deny all this with you know being able to do this via group policy. So then those credentials are not stored in the memory. So for example, if you are an attacker, you'll start at the account uh, tier two level and then traverse your way up to tier one. But if there's no tier, if there's no domain admin or there's no server admin credentials on that tier two, you won't be able to use that method of gaining credentials. There's other methods that you'll have to employ. Uh, protected user groups, uh, you know, that is something that came out. And if you're using protected user groups, then it there is something that you could uh, you could put up someone in a protected user group as like an administrator, and they won't be able to log in with W Digest which is another thing about enabling and disabling w, w Digest. NTLM, which if you know NTLM v1, is very vulnerable. Things that 2000, 2003 XP are running on, which is why those have been all uh, sunsetted. As well as different types of Kerbal's long-term keys. So when you're in that protected user groups, it's gonna require a ticket to be granted each time and not just long-lived keys. Uh, another thing is to remove the capability for local administrators to be logged in remotely on endpoints. So that thing that I talked about, the KB287-1997, that introduced two new SIDs, local account and local members and groups, administrator groups. This, you can specifically deny local accounts to be able to remotely log in or interactively log in to certain area, to certain other uh, things via group policy. And this is a way, so then, if, a, if an attacker, normally an attacker would come in and if they see that they have local local admin privileges, then they're gonna get system account level. Then at that level, they'll just start remoting and finding out new and different ways within the environment and going to different servers to gain that credential and, until they get to that domain admin that they've always wanted. Implementing LAPS, which is a randomization, it's a Microsoft product. Implementing LAPS is actually very easy, especially it'll do at the local account level. And also third-party technologies like CyberArk and other things that you are probably very well aware well of. Harden endpoints so that clear text passwords are not stored in memory. This is disabled w, w Digest. Now I will say caution: this is not something you can just disable right away, because there are certain applications that you'll have to verify. So this is something that requires some sort of planning. But a lot of this stuff, you could do it, and you might realize there's no uh, after effects. But for this. Disable, disable W Digest authentication because it does store it stored in memory. This token leak detect delay sec seconds. What this is, this is a registry that uh, you can put on a uh, on different endpoints and all throughout your environment that you want the credentials to be wiped away from memory, preferably th after 30 seconds. Right now, if it's set to zero or one, if it's set to one, then it will stay in memory till eternity. This one, you can set it up to stay in memory for 30 seconds and it gets wiped away after somebody logs in. And protect the user security groups I mentioned, it already stops a lot of the W Digest, the token leak delay, and all that. So you know, putting these into your privilege accounts into these types of groups will kind of protect your environment. How is connectivity exploited? Remember, access, credentials, plus connectivity, the persistence. 
with correct credentials, Windows Protocol allows for remote connectivity. You know, that is gonna happen already. The placement of backdoors on endpoints, so then you have that persistence so they can beacon out. A lot of times you'll notice that when backdoors are implemented, especially with ransomware, they're, they're kind of DNSing out to make sure they still have connectivities to then start pushing out their uh, malicious payload. Common protocols that are used for lateral movement, SMB, which is uh, what we had talked about, maybe disabling SMB v1, but also RDPing, which is kind of traversing through the environment, doing reconnaissance, and WMI. Common methods around lateral movement and malware deployment is, you know, PS exec, it uses the SMB for connectivity, RDP, and certain scripts that uses WMI. And if you are around administration, you kind of know what, what we're talking about with WMI. Premediate connectivity hardening. Restrict system to system access. There is no reason why an accountant's workstation should be able to RDP to a marketing person's workstation. There is no use case that I've came across in, uh, that a accountant or another accountant for a specific RDP access. These are certain things with Windows Firewall with advanced security features, you can deny these types of logins from uh, RDP, SMB. These are all methods that from a use case, there's really no reason uh, this should be happening. And this is automatically enabled with Windows. So what this does is you wanna reduce this ability. Uh, you know, you build your requirements, you build your uh, use cases, and with firewall segmentation, with security, you can block specific IPs from the, remember, we, you wanna not only do network-based indicators at the network layer, you wanna also do from host-based network-based uh, indicators. So, so then, for example, you don't want it to go out to a certain bad IP or a specific phishing uh, bad domain. You can specifically do it through Windows Firewall, especially with advanced features. Restricting egress traffic. Your server should not be going on the internet. Your domain control should not have the ability to go on Google. These are things to reduce your attack surface. You know, you don't, I mean, there should be specifically ability to just do that certain task with specific ports and protocols to allow them to administer whatever they need. And um, you want to remove the capability of privileged accounts to be used for a remote login. You could do that with that KB uh, 287 1997 with deny login locally and batch. Disable unnecessary services on endpoint and firewalls. Admin share do not, you know, what are you using for from an uh, endpoints and as well as leverage privilege access with workstations. So using pause, using bash and host, using jump host to do all your administration. You don't want to, from your, as an administrator, to just go in and go to a duck or active director using the computers and an administrator and administer from it because that's the same computer you go on the internet with that you go and check emails. So these are types of things if you want to go into a specific privilege access workstation or what the old school Linux version is bash and host or specific that's been hardened that has all the logging and all the visibility detections on there to alert of anything is kind of awry and they have the audit trails there. That's kind of where you want to ha have a lot of your administration. As well as for VPNing, there should be a separate thing for uh, administrators to VPN in. I want to walk through this real quick. The privilege account management, this is the tiered architecture model I talked about, zero, one, and two, kind of the privilege access workstation, the, the multi-factor authentication, using group policies to restrict privilege account usage and where they are being used and how much, what type of uh, login they can have. Protected user groups we talked about, restricted admin RDP, removing cache credentials from LSAS, which is that KB287-1997. DSRM with writables and read-only domain controllers. Read-only domain controllers is not a fad right now, or they don't really push it. But if you're around since the 2008 days, that was something they pushed really heavy. Uh, and now they're kind of pushing, uh, kind of going away from it, as well as separate VPN profiles for admins. And and want to kind of go through quickly uh, the attacker lifecycle. That's kind of uh, summarizing. There's an initial compromise, externally facing uh, servers and services. You have your phishing. Then they establish these footholds with uh, they're going to get those credentials, establish foothold, which is using backdoors. Uh, putting web uh, web shows and then the escalating privileges and credential dumping and going from workstation to workstation and finding where they can find that privileged user 
and internal reconnaissance, doing AD uh, power show command sets, AD find, AD explorer, things that you can get out on the internet to then find out your environment, study your environment. Sometimes attackers are in the environment for months studying how, how are things administered, how are, where's your sites and services, or is it, is your delegation model by site, or is it by services, is it by uh, just kind of everything is in the user's folder and uh, in the user's container and everything happens there. And then this whole internal reconnaissance of escalate privilege, they keep on doing it until they get to that domain admin and they can then compromise everything. And then at the end of the day, they can deploy ransomware, crypto miners, steal uh, IP data, or just be very destructive if they so will, please. This is a continuous, so pre-mediation is a continuous process. So this is things that you can implement today on your environment, but this is something that should always be happening from proactively. Yes, you have your risk assessments, and these risk assessments using different standards like NIST and all that, these are important. But these are specific techniques that attackers are using today that uh, I am right now on probably half a dozen IR that they're used as some of the same techniques that I'm talking about today that's been patched and fixed two, three years ago, they're still using that because they know uh, people dislike change and they don't change their environment. Integrate methodology as part of your risk management. So you are doing your, your NIST assessment. You are doing your ISO 27001. These assessments within your organization, but add these specific techniques because these those frameworks don't really, they may talk about legacy protocols, but what specific protocols are considered legacy? What is considered business need? Test and verify effectiveness of the process. After this is done, there's always you want to test the effectiveness. Of it, so then you aren't that case study that we talked about where they bypassed MFA. And then continue, adapt, and enhance. And really, that, that concludes my presentation on premediation. We have some time. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Questions? Go on once. Yes, sir. Yes, definitely it is. So if you exchange emails with anybody who's really security conscious, you'll, you'll get those plain text emails like you're in a notepad. It's terrible for like an organization to implement fully. But yes, definitely embedded HTMLs. But but really, with if you are at Office 365, these things are all blocked with some of the advanced features in, in Office. It's where those attachments come in that you know a lot of times they won't have the visibility or purview in exactly what's in those attachments until it's been downloaded. And once you download and you open it, that's when the specific thing executes. So that's how certain things bypass, you know, some of these Microsoft or other types of proof point type filtering. But yeah, a lot of that, that is a possibility, but definitely it, it is kind of overcome from different security solutions out there. Well, f yeah, so from attachment perspective, if you're sending an attachment, things like Proofpoint, they have that, uh, if it's uh, something considered malicious, it won't even come in your inbox. Office 365 has that, depending on what license version. It, it, if it's a malicious attachment, you won't even receive it. You have an email, no attachment. So there are things that are scanning as well as DLP solutions, uh, you know, data, data loss pre uh, prevention solutions that then prevents you from sending emails with uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers, so they can tell by the way things are, if it's a credit card number or it's a social security number, it'll block that from even uh, going out there. Now, th there's different ways from the email side that you could still do it, uh, uh, that you just kind of push on top of your security stack. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much.